Alright, so I had this whole introduction planned out when this whole thing was going to be one big video. But then I hit uh, 35 pages of script on a total of 6 out of 8 games. So here we are now, a video in which I dissect some of the good things and bad things that Game Freak has done from generation to generation of Pokemon design. Now, I know that this whole idea is probably going to be a cesspool of disagreement, because at the end of the day, some people are going to be fascinated with the rock that has arms, and others are going to think, yes, I too drew fun doodles as a kid. There are going to be some ideas that I find more creative than others. Sometimes I'm going to look at a design and go, that's dumb. I don't have any background knowledge of how different legendaries think or act in any anime adaptation. Quickly, Ash, I need you to hop on my back and throw nickels at the people below. <laughs> Me? Yes. I don't know about the Easter egg that Sakurai dropped into Pokemon Mystery Heroes Turbo Enhanced Edition, which portrays Mankey as a true prophet of the end times. And I haven't read every Pokedex entry to know how Spoink feels when it rains. I'm just a guy who decided to play every main release Pokemon game back to back and evaluate every major facet I could think of. So in this part one of, I don't know, three or four videos, I'm gonna point at a Pokemon with my finger and tell you why it's God's gift to Earth or the reason why Terror still exists. Alright, so Pokemon Red and Blue. We'll start with the starters because they have the word start in their name and I'm starting. Why did I write that? As a kid, I honestly thought all of the starters were fascinating in their own ways. I had a Charizard in my first playthrough because, of course I did. Honestly, they still all kind of hold up fine in their own iconic way, but Blastoise in particular has always been kind of dumb to me in the way that it's just a turtle with artillery in its shell. It just seemed kind of out of place, I guess. You got your plant monster, you got your dragon, you got your big turtle. Wait, big turtle with cannons. Beyond that, you've got some pretty standard designs for a bunch of different animal types, and they get their jobs done sure enough. Some particularly interesting designs included the idea of Parasect being a creature that's being taken over by a parasitic fungus, Cubone wearing the skull of its dead mother, Eevee's evolution flexibility, the concept of fossil Pokemon, Magikarp going from being the weakest Pokemon to one of the strongest, and so on. I also like the look and naming of Scyther, Haunter, and the giant horror movie monster, Golbat. As enthralling as a lot of these designs are, there are probably just as many Gen 1 Pokemon that fall flat in terms of unique design that isn't outright stupid. A lot of people tend to covet Gen 1's Pokemon as nearly untouchable and laugh at newer designs like the older generations didn't have their share of boring or absolutely stupid design choices. My favorite example of this is Seal, which is a... which is a seal. You know, the real-life animal. Sick moves, Game Freak. There's also other obvious choices. Voltorb, Execute, Mr. Mime. Someone designed this. This is in the same game as this. Guys, 140 Pokemon would have been fine. We didn't really have a standard for the amount of Pokemon at this point. There's also a lot of really unimpressive evolutions that were just completely uninspired. Man, everyone loves Pikachu. He's basically the mascot. What's he evolve into? I don't know, fatter Pikachu, I guess. We got this cool tadpole Pokemon that evolves to have arms and legs. What's the third face look like? Hey, you know how we got this little wormling with like no arms or legs or wings or anything like that? Yeah, stretch that long boy out. Bam, that's a whole nother Pokemon. All right, we got Machop and then Machoke. What's another action that starts with a CH? What if we named him Machamp and gave him more arms. Legendary Pokemon in red and blue are simple but effective. The three birds don't look ridiculous, which seems exceedingly rare in the newer gens when looking at designs. But I'd be lying if I said that they impressed me, if you know what I mean. They sure did back in the day, don't get me wrong, but they just kind of exist for me now. Beyond that, I think Mewtwo will always stick out in my mind as the legendary Pokemon. But his design isn't particularly overwhelming either. Which is fine, it's just what it is, honestly. And I think I would rather have it that way than go the route of having 25 different attachments to a Pokemon and having it look like a Swiss army knife rather than a legendary creature. Also, I want to briefly mention here that I probably won't be talking about most of the exclusive legendary Pokemon like Mew and whatnot. Let's move on to the second generation. So the starters all tend to have the same quirk to their designs. The first form looks pretty different from the second, but the final form kind of just looks like a bigger second form. This one blooms, this one leans, and this one stands. 
Additionally, there's no secondary typing for this set of starters, which is kind of a letdown. I know it's kind of nitpicky, but hey, I'm out here dissecting Pokemon designs. While there aren't a lot of new additions to the second generation of Pokemon, the designs are all actually relatively solid in that they aren't overwhelmingly creative, but I don't mind them existing. They just tend to follow the idea of, hey, we haven't made this animal yet, take a crow, slap a hat on him, done. Like, I enjoy looking at Hoot Hoot or Sentret, but I don't particularly want them in my party, per se. The baby Pokemon and held item trading fusions are a nice way to design another stage to previously existing Pokemon, and I do enjoy having them in the game to a small degree, even if I don't really have friends to trade with. I particularly like Zatu, Ursaring, and Tyranitar design-wise, and hate Unknown because it's just the alphabet. But I don't really have a particularly strong disdain or emphatic love for the second generation. The most important contribution to the series here is the addition of Dark and Steel types, though. It's interesting because when these were introduced as types in the second game of the franchise, my kid self thought that they'd be constantly adding new types to the series, starting with a light type. Thinking about it now, it'd be entirely too much if they added even just one type for every generation. But these types are welcome in that they make several others more or less viable than they used to be. In particular, Ice and Rock gained another weakness, which I, I don't really care about. But Psychic and Ghost types also gained a new weakness in the form of Dark. And those two types were pretty damn dominant and still are to a degree. So Dark was a much needed counter. Also, fighting feels a lot more important now that it can beat these two types. As far as legendaries go, the three new dogs are fine and all, but I kind of feel like they're just another flavor of the bird trio. I mean, why not make the dogs different types at least? I guess Suicune is water instead of ice, but they all lost a second typing also. I would honestly just rather have the birds all day over the dogs. And Ho-Oh and Lugia are fine mascots, also simple in design. I've never been impressed with Lugia if I'm wholly honest. I think it's his wings. They kind of just look like big, dumb hands. I do like the psychic flying mix, but Ho-Oh's design is just superior in my eyes. Alright, let's move on to Ruby and Sapphire. There's a lot of new designs in Generation 3, and I think it's one of the big reasons that the game had such a big impact on my childhood. Hone starters do a pretty good job of making every single form look like they're related to each other while also looking pretty distinguishable. If I were to really nitpick, I would say that Marsh Tom kind of looks like it would be a bigger mudkip if it wasn't bipedal, which is interesting because it goes back to not being bipedal with Swampert. Unfortunately for this generation, the grass type gets shafted when it comes to a secondary flavor, which kind of sucked because I chose Trico as a kid, but eh, it is what it is. The biggest thing that Generation 3's Pokemon have going for it, though, are the type mixtures. This set of Pokemon really did mix a lot of types that hadn't been mixed in the past, or had been mixed very few times. These mixes include the likes of Lotad, Shiftry, Shedinja, Breloom, Sableye, Metacham, Sharpedo, Flygon, and so on. Like the previous generation, some animals that weren't covered before are covered now, and new creations like Nosepass, Claydol, Hariyama, Glalie, Altaria, and Crotaly make their way into the Pokemon pool. Wormpole is an interesting example of taking what is basically a Caterpie mix with a Weedle and letting it evolve into a Silcoon or a Cascoon depending on its personality value, which confused me as a kid and equally confuses me as an adult. Ninkata's evolution into two Pokémon at once is fascinating, especially since Shedinja has one health and can't be hit by anything except for super effective moves, weather, and status effects. These are just a few examples that make this generation stand out in my eyes. But that's not to say that this generation is untouchable. There are still plenty of things to pick at, like Puchena being a slightly less interesting Houndour, Taillow being another Pidgey, Skitty being basically a Meowth. There's stuff like Surskit literally being the only bug and water type that we get until Generation 7, but it evolves into a bug and flying type for some reason, which we have plenty of. Plusel and Minun. Minun? 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 Minun. It's gotta be Minun. Minun, the cheering Pokemon. Plusel and Minun make me feel like Game Freak is constantly pressured to create the quote unquote new Pikachu of the franchise every generation, and they kind of upset me with how lame they are. I don't know why Volbeat and Illumise exist either, other than to show up in double battles. 
Gulpin and Swalot are just another new Grimer and Muck, Vipers and Ekans that doesn't evolve, Phoebus's rarity is unreasonable even if the way it evolves is, I guess, interesting? Honestly, it's kinda just a revamped Gyarados, if you ask me. Although even then, Gyarados has that flying subtype, which makes it kind of unique. The devs seem to be afraid to mix the ghost type with a secondary type for whatever reason, even though they'll make a Sableye have zero weaknesses with the Dark and Ghost mix, at least until Gen 6. Also, why Love Disk? Who's using this? What's it for? As far as Gen 3 legendaries go, the Reggie family looks like something a kid would design. I mean, come on, look at these things. You remember when I was like, ah, they should do the legendary trio with different types? Not like this. Latios and Latias are slightly more impressive, but I mean, they also look kind of dumb. I do like that they're Psychic and Dragon type though, but the real winners here are the mascots of the three Gen 3 games. Kyogre, Groudon, and Rayquaza all feel like ancient legendary Pokemon to me. I think it's the lines on their bodies and the sunken in eyes, as stupid as that sounds. I just wish that Kyogre and Groudon had a second typing. I mean, Groudon is just begging for a fire typing with its looks, and Kyogre could easily be a dark or psychic as well. Either way, I have to say that this is the best generation in terms of design so far, but we'll see what else we got down the pipeline. Alright, Diamond and Pearl. The only issue I really have with the starters is the Chimchar line. I do like the fire and fighting mix a lot, and I really like Infernape's design, but there isn't a lot of difference between the three forms. And the typing was literally done in the last generation with Blaziken. Not a big deal though, honestly. Beyond that, Piplup turns into an actual battleship, and his intermediate stage looks really stupid. But that's not a bad thing either, honestly. It's actually the Pokemon that I feel strongest about when I look at an evolutionary line as if the Pokemon were aging. The first form looks like a baby or a toddler. The second form looks like an awkward teenager and the final form looks like an adult who files taxes and has a 401k. And then Torterra is probably the first grass type starter that I would actually like having in my party because grass starters finally got a decent secondary type in this generation. The rest of Generation 4's original designs were kind of subpar if I'm gonna be honest. There are a few neat designs like Krikatoon, Hippowdon, and Toxicroak. I know that Bronzong is kind of a weird one and that it's just a big bell, but I actually kind of like it for some reason. Obama Snow is a cool mix of grass and ice that hasn't been seen in any other Pokemon. Vespaquen is actually super creative in how it's obtained and how it functions. Beyond that, Garchomp is a fine addition, and I guess I could add something like Bastiodon to the fine category as well, but it's hard to press me for more than that on Generation 4. Pachirisu is Game Freak trying to reinvent Pikachu again. Rampardos has the potential to be pretty intimidating, but it looks like a short, fat T-Rex that's just a rock type. Weasel would be cool if it had another typing to it besides just water. I mean, honestly, we have a large abundance of pure water type Pokemon already, and even Bidoof mixes its normal type with water for some reason. Starly is literally a new Pidgey again, but I guess it looks cooler? Glammeow is yet another Meowth type Pokemon, although it does turn into an ugly Pokemon instead, which is kind of giving that idea a new coat of paint. Why is Chatot here? What compels me to use him or a Lumineon or a Cherim? But that's really just it. Generation 4, for the most part, seems to look at the franchise and say, okay, but what if this had this? What if Apom, a Pokemon that no one cares about, had an evolution with two hand tails? What if Murkrow, or Misdreavus, or Sneasel got an evolution? And some of these are actually cool, but they don't really do much for me, and honestly, they probably should have just been in Generation 2 to start with. I honestly think that a good chunk of Generation 4 is just an extension of Generation 2. And it doesn't just stop at evolutions, there's tons of baby forms that have also been tossed into the mix as well. Mantyke, Happiny, Munchlax, Mime Jr. Yes! Yes! Yeah! Actually, you know what? I'm gonna come up with a baby Pokemon right now. Alright, we'll just get rid of its neck. There we go. Move that down. We'll call it Gurf. He makes this noise. So what about the legendary Pokemon? Well, you remember Mew? Mew was cool, right? Mew was cool because it was so fabled and rare and hard to obtain legitimately. Mew was cool because it could learn any move. Mew was cool because Mewtwo already existed in the base games. So why am I talking about it then? Because the legendary trio in this game is just Mew, but three times over. 
I mean, look at these three and tell me who thought this was a good idea. They're just plain psychic types, they look almost identical, and there's nothing compelling about them. At least Dialga, Palkia, and Giratina are all interesting dragon mixes. I'm actually not opposed to their designs either, although they are starting to get out there with the amount of add-ons. Dialga is sleek and represents the steel type well, but I couldn't tell you that Palkia is a water type at first glance. Girthatina is a big boy, and it's definitely intimidating in its own right. I'd honestly conclude the Gen 4 evaluation by just putting it right at the bottom of the list so far, though. It's just got too little substance that I enjoyed personally, and it feels extremely uninspired as a generation. Let's move over to Pokemon design for Black and White. Technically Black and White 2 also. Generation 5. Alright, so the starters are a mixed bag for me. I'm gonna come out and say that I hate Snivy and everything that follows it. I get the whole smug meme that started at the time, but it just gets longer, and it loses its legs. How the hell does something evolve to lose its legs? And on top of that, it's back to just being a grass type. Oshawott's evolutionary line is just water type too, but I think Dewat might be my favorite second form of any starter. It's just cute as heck and it looks like a spiffy little fighting boy. But then there's Samurott. I don't like it, I'm not gonna lie. Like it looks absolutely nothing like Oshawott or Dewat. And if you showed me the three, I would think that Samurott is some random legendary that's been swimming around. It honestly looks closer to an evolved Lapras, if anything. The Tapig line, though, is definitely my favorite. Two types, all three forms look like they belong and are getting stronger. Plus, you got this big barrel of a monster ready to uppercut the nearest Sentret into orbit. Unfortunately, this is the third generation in a row where the fire type is paired with fighting. It especially sucks that the only fighting move that Embor learns naturally without breeding is Arm Thrust. I mean, it has a second typing, but that really doesn't seem to be capitalized on unless you go get Brick Break. Alright, let's move on to the shit show that is Gen 5 Pokemon design. Not a strong showing, honestly, but there are a few surprises that I enjoyed thoroughly. So we got our 3 evolution flying normal type. Check. We got our 2 evolution cat with added dark type bonus. Check. We got Rattata replacement number 5. Check. But most importantly, where is my new Pikachu? Good god, the Pikachu flies now. I think it's nice that they finally replaced Zubat with Woobat, even if it is a silly name. But beyond that, there's actually quite a few designs and type mixes that I really enjoyed, and it's so strange because Gen 5 is this odd mixed bag of, oh, I really love these Pokemon, but I really dislike the rest of them, or a lot of them. Like, Jellicent is one of my favorite Pokemon of all time, along with Crocodile, Chandelure, and Hydreigon. I love that they're finally letting the ghost type mix with a bigger variety of other types. And they branched out to making the bug type much more viable than it's been in the past as well. So there are some pretty good merits to Gen 5 design. But for the most part, there are just some stupid looking Pokemon and logistically weak decisions made here. The sheer amount of these designs that I would put right on the fridge is just appalling between Gen 4 and 5. Nothing is going to compel me to use ice cream. Not three evolutions, not great stats, nothing. Seismitoad is fine, but Palpitoad is a dick. And you're not gonna convince me otherwise, that is a dick. This is a haunted sarcophagus. I mean, the ability's kinda cool, but if I'm gonna choose a pure ghost type, I'd go with Gengar, or Mismagius, or Dusclops. How in the hell are you gonna shove out a Magneton, but with one less type and twice as stupid? Roggenrola is dumb in pretty much every single way you can conceive of. Every form of it, its name, its type, the amount you see it, the fact that it looks like a walking glory hole. You ever imagine Sock and Throw without their karate clothing on? You're welcome. Wait boys, we need yet another Grimer and Muck. What about actual living garbage? Yes, you two can embrace your inner personality by raising the living embodiment of liquid trash. Fetus Pokemon is a weird choice, but I'm not sure it's unwelcome. It's just honestly surprising. Why is Electross not a water type too? The Pokedex very clearly says that it crawls out of the ocean using its arms and drags prey back down into the ocean. Yet it's an electric type with an ability that gives it no weaknesses. Cool. The fact is that Generation 5 added the most new Pokemon to the franchise ever, even more than the first generation. But I'd estimate that over half of those are uninteresting, boring, or just ridiculous. The legendary Pokemon range from stupid looking to okay at best. 
the Lackey 2 Cream Team over here look... dumb. I think it's honestly the BDSM tales. The three legendary Eons are certainly Pokemon 100%. At least they all have a secondary fighting type, so I can't really complain there. And then lastly, the main event dragons are... I don't know, they're not bad design-wise, honestly. I just don't like their big stupid tails. I feel like they don't belong. Alright, so Generation 6, the x Dex. As far as starters go, Chespin's evolutionary line will always be hilarious to me. Like, you got this cute little cousin of Oshawa, and then me as an 8-year-old. And then, I'm not sure what this is, but someone decided to look at my drawings as a child with all the spikes that I drew on monsters, and then stick this goofball's face on it. And he, and he knows how to fight now. That's a good boy. Then we have the furry fantasy dream team, Fennekin and the scaling anthropomorphic army. They're fine, I guess. I just honestly don't know how I feel about Delphox looking like someone's fursona. I do really like the psychic fire combination. Then of course we've got Greninja. I also like his combination of types, but I think the second form is silly and could probably look a bit different than the final form. I mean, it kind of just looks more like a lizard and kind of dopier. But either way, I like that all of these starters have two types and that they all gain their second typing in their final form. That always feels like the final form is a final form when it happens. Beyond that, every one of these type combinations have only been done about two times before this. I like that my starter feels unique in that regard no matter what I choose. It's a step up from Black and White's two out of three only having one type. Alright, to kick off the rest of Generation 6, the obvious contribution to the National Dex is the Fairy type. I'm still pretty hesitant about it, but overall I agree with its role in the type pool. It gives Poison and Steel a little more offensive relevance, and it gives Dragon a much needed weakness. Although I'm not sure if I agree with Bug being not very effective against yet another type. As far as actual designs go, they're about what you'd expect, I suppose. I'm honestly not enamored with pretty much every fairy type. Their designs tend to encompass just cute looking blobs, or a lot of the time they just look kind of like plants, even though they're not grass type, which is kind of weird. I mean, look at Flabebe, it's just a flower. Beyond that, a few older types got retyped as fairy, which is a good call. Uh, hey, hey guys, I, uh, I want to take a moment here to tell you that, uh, I, I searched for Gardevoir on Google Images so that I could, uh, so I could get the, uh, the, the picture to, to put in this video, uh, for this particular part here. Um, I'd show you the search, but there's seven layers of Gardevoir porn that were caked into the results. Uh, uh most importantly here, though, I found this, um, this is, uh, this is a product that someone can purchase for uh, 950 of the letter R. I know this had nothing to do with the Pokemon design thing, but um, I didn't want to shoulder this burden alone. In addition to this new type, Game Freak seems to have finally broken the code of remaking the Pidgey line verbatim. This comes in the form of Talonflame, which I could actually see myself using. It still hasn't stopped Game Freak from polluting the other types with the normal type, though. To me, normal is only useful for countering ghosts and getting your shit pushed in by fighting types. The only time that I'd want it mixed into my type pool is if it were a psychic or a ghost. Now, I know that not every Pokemon can be a viable, unstoppable, perfectly typed killing machine, but they can make sense, or should, rather. Here's an example. What's the difference between an Arcanine and a Pyroar? One's a cat, one's a dog, right? So why's the cat got a normal type attached to it? What makes the Pyroar normal? It just seems kind of random to me, honestly. Beyond this, some notable standouts to me include Pangoro, Malamar, Dragalge, Drag Dragalage? Dragal, 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 Trevenant, and Big Ghost Sword. A lot of people laughed BGS out of the room, but I actually thought he was kind of fun to play with. And let's be honest here, nothing is going to beat out Keychain for the dumbest Pokemon award. Other contenders for bad design include Furfrau, Titanic Iceberg, and Licky Licky. How are you going to come up with an evolution for a Pokemon that no one has ever cared about, but shove something like Carnivine into your Pokedex with no upgrade? I mean, Carnivine looks like it could evolve or honestly have a lesser form to it, but it's just kind of there by itself. I don't think I've ever seen anybody use it. Also, we got the new Pikachu, boys. But honestly, I can't complain that much about Gen 6. 
It's the lowest amount of new Pokémon added to the franchise in any generation, but most of it's pretty damn solid, and I'd rather have 50 new Pokémon that I could see using to some degree instead of having 150 new Pokémon and only being interested in a third of it. Generation 5 added over double the amount Generation 6 did, and I'm a lot more impressed with 6's selection. The cover legendaries are a bit lame to me. When you start making your Pokémon look like letters of the alphabet, I tend to lose interest. Zygarde's super weird, but I actually like it, honestly. Which is a surprise to me, because it's probably the first Legendary I've liked since Gen 3. Alright, Sun and Moon, let's finish this up. I love the Rowlet line. It starts out as grass and flying, and then shifts to ghost and grass, which is the first time we've seen something like that in a starter. All three forms feel pretty unique, while still looking related, which is always good. Then we have Incineroar. I like the fire and dark combo, and you can tell just by looking at this Big Loads build that someone wanted to go for four fire and fighting starters in a row, but they managed to change course and create the first fire and dark type combo since Houndor. I don't think Torakat is unique enough to justify being the second form, though. It just looks like a bigger Litten. Then we have Poplio. Nah. I don't like it. I don't like its second form, and I'm aggressively apathetic towards Primarina. It's only saving grace being its fairy subtype. But that being said, the Alolan Pokedex is some of the smartest stuff I've seen out of Game Freak to avoid trying to crank out 100 new Pokémon and still make the game feel fresh. You take these older and tired Pokémon and you give them little mustaches and change their typing. It's honestly a great idea. This idea gives us Dark Raticate and Muck, Steel Dug Trio, Electric Geodude, Ice Sandshrew and Vulpix, Ghost and Fire Marowak, Psychic Raichu, Dopey Persian, and Big Dumb Executor. Honestly, this combined with the new Pokémon they shoved into Generation 7 gave it more life than I ever expected it would. Sure, it's a gimmick, but it's one that they did right in my eyes. But let's jump into the new, new Pokémon here. After Talonflame, what Pidgey replacement do you think we'll get? Maybe a grass and flying, or maybe a psychic and flying would be cool. Two can Sam! Alright, let's get this one out of the way. This is Trump. We can talk around it, we can ignore it. Looks like a nice this little guy, actually. Is goddamn Trump. Also, this is a bunch of flowers. And here's the Pikachu clone. Alright, let's talk about the cool stuff now. We got some pretty cool type combinations in Sun and Moon, which is always welcome. As far as actual designs go, though, there are only a handful that I really enjoy for their looks. And the rest are interesting, but not necessarily my thing. Wishy-Washy is a really unique idea with its schooling ability. I love seeing Pokémon ideas pushed like this, especially when it's not just another legendary. It gives me the same feeling that Shedinja gave me when it was revealed in Gen 3. Delmize is kind of weird in that it's a big ship anchor that's ghost and grass instead of ghost and water. I mean, I get that it's supposed to be all the seaweed and algae and whatnot, but I mean, if you want to do another ghost and grass that's akin to an object, why not like a field scarecrow? He makes this noise. Ah! I don't know who decided to make Salazzle look like this. I, I don't, I don't honestly need to know either. Hey, Paulson, you got that Pokemon done? What the f Como is a cool idea, but it's definitely kind of odd looking. The most enjoyment I've derived from actual looks in this game is from the Alolan variants. I think it's honestly just because I'm extremely familiar with these older Pokémon, and it's awesome seeing a fresh new look on them. Let's finish this whole thing off with the legendaries, though. And there are quite a lot of them in Gen 7. Alright, so the Tapu Squad. They're not horrendous to look at, they all fit a theme and have a place in the game, but I'm honestly not wild over them. I do like that they have a different typing beyond Fairy, so Game Freak managed to not Azelf, Mesprit, Uxie themselves again. So what about the big cover boys, Lunala and Solgaleo? Eh. I like that these legendaries actually have a three-step evolution to them, that's pretty unique in and of itself. If I'm to be honest, I'd like Lunala a lot more if it had a body with arms and legs, but it's kind of just a loose shower curtain. Solgaleo's the cooler design in my eyes, which sucks because I like the Ghost Psychic mix better. But then we got Ultra Beasts. Big Jellyfish is fine in that it introduces yet another unused type combination, but then there's Buzzwool. I have never wanted a legendary Pokémon more than I have when I first laid eyes on this absolute Herculean unit of a Pokémon. I mean, look at that! And to counter this mountain of beef, you've got Feramosa, which is kind of intimidating in its own way, to be honest. 
Both of these are also a type that have been represented one other time in the franchise, which is very cool. Zerkatree, on the other hand, is dumb. I don't know, it just approaches that Regirock Ice Steel level of creativity to me. And its typing isn't doing many favors for it either. Same with Celestila, although on a lesser level, because Celestila is weird and I, I like weird. I just feel like someone was challenged to bring a particular shape to life and they did their best with it. I feel that way about Kartana too though, it's just this pointy star-shaped object. Guzzlord on the other hand is, is basically a chimera from Mother 3. It's not a bad thing though, this monster and the lore behind it is honestly amazing. I mean it does look kind of stupid, but I don't know, I just can't bring myself to hate it. And then finally there's Necrozma, which, yeah, I don't know. I just don't feel it. It's just another shape to me. I guess it's not bad, it's ominous in the way that it's this pitch dark looming thing. But again, aggressive indifference. And that's about it for Pokemon designs across seven generations. I got one more thing to kind of go through before the end of this, and that is that I'm 100% aware that I'm probably going to upset some people. But at the end of the day, it's all just different opinions. There are people that are going to be livid that I could possibly compliment Generation 7, or be so harsh on whatever generation is their personal favorite. But I can tell you this much. Every single Pokemon generation brings to the table both flaws and positive additions. It doesn't matter which one is your personal favorite. If you prefer one generation to another, by all means, please talk about it. Say what makes you feel so strongly or weakly about a particular generation. But if you're the type of person who wants to defend a generation of Pokemon so vehemently that you'll openly attack someone for not agreeing with your point of view 100%, then you are only making the series worse. I've seen this type of behavior firsthand and I've heard about it from friends of mine who dared speak their emotions incorrectly about certain generations. Criticism makes all creations, not just Pokemon, better. And everyone is completely entitled to their own views on the subject. Sorry if this comes off on a little more of a serious note, but there are certain generations that people tend to get frenzied about and it gets to a point where people lose sight of the fact that we all love and appreciate this franchise and that we all want to see it continue to improve regardless of personal preference. Anyways, I was going to initially combine this video with my story and plot evaluation, but as it turns out, it takes a little while to beat eight RPGs back to back. So I figured I'd push this one out separately for now. I'll get back to you guys with story and analysis and mechanic and map design over the next couple of videos. Until then, I stream medium rarely over on my Twitch. I occasionally partake in Twitter escapades. And I cultivate some of the most exemplary minds and topics in my coveted Discord. So the next time you think to yourself, man, it's been about a month or two months or seven months since the last video, come hop into the Discord or check out my Twitter and I'm sure there will be some sort of answer there. Anyways, that's it. Have a good one.